Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another D-Day event. Good that you all found your way here um, to Soa House. And um, yeah, today, next topic. Uh, my name is Andrea Bauer. And uh, this is Boris Moschkowitz. And we are the initiators of D-Day. And uh, today we want to talk about the new work order or how uh, the concept of work has changed. And especially if we look at the last two decades, um, we see a great paradigm shift in, um, in uh, the concept of work. Uh, people don't commit their whole lives to one company anymore. Uh, they rather stay with a company or with a job for 13 months than for 30 years. And uh, we see a, a growing amount of freelancer or so-called knowledge workers uh, who uh, choose flexibility over stability. And technology allows them to do so. And also companies are become more flexible, flexible and more open. Um, searching for talent globally is a common tool. And they are also uh, looking all the time constantly for smart tools to uh, manage their on-demand tasks. So we have a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss, and uh, therefore we invited very smart, experienced, and bright, charming panelists. And Boris will introduce them. Thank you. All right. Well, before I say a couple of <coughs> words about um, Monica and Christina, first let me also say hello to this time, not only to you, because we also have viewers on the internet. Hello to everybody out there on Flimmy, we're streaming live. Uh, don't worry, we're, we're filming the stage. If you don't want to be in the image, you don't have to be. It's just us and we're doing this voluntarily. So hi everybody uh, on Flimmy. Flimmy is an app from Berlin. We're very proud that it's a Berlin-based app now challenging Meerkat and Periscope, so props out there. And now, but two very passionate women who have been basically dedicating their uh, recent years to making the lives easier of people who want to work and collaborate and do things differently. And uh, Christina Reason, head of, uh, or actually general manager of Evernote for Europe, for the Middle East, for Africa, she's touring all these territories and introducing a very powerful tool and a very interesting tool that gives um, many knowledge workers and we have to differentiate and we'll do that uh, during our talk between industrial workers handy workers and knowledge workers knowledge workers an amazing opportunity to work together and to create new environments and monica is actually part of a group of people called dark horse innovation and there are these um, 30 young innovative creative knowledge workers who've decided to do something together in a very different way and uh, we'll talk about that so thank you for joining us and uh, Let's get started. Um. Oh, I did it without the microphone, but uh, let's do it <laughs> with um, if maybe. Think everyone uh, heard you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, the first question I would um, direct at uh, Monica because I think that is very unique. Today we were with Christina at the office of uh, Dark Horse, and we were talking to you and figuring out. Well, that's uh, that's a unique concept. Thirty people starting something, um, no boss, no structures, or maybe there are structures. So I would like to know what was your motivation to do that and uh, how did it develop in the, in the recent years? Sure. Um, so we started out as a group of students, all 30 of us studied uh, together. And after we finished our year, we met at the HBI School of Design Thinking. After that one year there, um, we became good friends and we also came to like the way of working that we got introduced to there. Um, and after the year there, we figured like that can't be it. Um, let's do something together. But we didn't set out um, and plan to become a company, but it was rather the other way around that we um, eventually realized um, that we need to earn money with the stuff that we do together in order to stay together because otherwise people would go off to other jobs or do different things. So that's actually how we started out accidentally becoming um, a company and we call ourselves agency for innovation development for lack of a better word. But if you have one, please let us know. We're still not really satisfied with that. Um, so we've been doing that for six years now um, and we basically help um, companies to innovate products and services and also on their company culture and um, we learned how to do that from our own well mostly from our own failures during the last five years so and um, what is then a new working uh, a modern working space for you for you both 
I mean, you are providing the tools for them, Christina. As Boris mentioned today, uh, we were visiting Monica and the Dark Horse, and it just hit me. This is the future of work. This is the modern workspace because it is all about sharing knowledge, coming together to build something truly great that has an impact. And if you look at knowledge workers today, they are not driven by necessarily money and benefits. It's more about ideas and having an impact, coming together, working with smart people in a flexible environment that yeah. adapts to their needs. It's not like they adapt to whatever system. And together they are making a difference. And when we designed Evernote, this is exactly what we had in mind. We actually built Evernote for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we started seven years ago. And basically what happened was that you know, we were a bunch of friends coming together and being overwhelmed with all this crazy amount of information coming at us every day. And we thought there must be a smarter way to, to deal with this and to work and to just manage all the knowledge around us. Mm -hmm. And we thought if we come up with a solution, there's a high chance that millions of people out there will like it too. Yeah. And, and today we have uh, 100 registered million, 100 million registered users worldwide. And Evernote has been growing mostly organically via word of mouth. And mm -hmm. this is because people really found it very useful. And through, through Evernote or through working with Evernote, you probably also saw uh, the, the value shift which's going along with this paradigm shift in, in working with knowledge workers, with more and more knowledge workers around. What can you say about that? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we have noticed that many of our users, two thirds of our users approximately, they were using Evernote in a work context. And by doing also some research, We've, we've noticed that people, despite their bosses and managers you know, prohibiting them from using modern technology, mm -hmm. they were using it anyway because they were able to do a, a better work. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's, it's really a question, smart companies, I think, who will be successful in the future, they need, first of all, they need to trust their people. You know, when you hire somebody, you really trust that they are absolutely great at what they are doing. Yeah trust them, empower them, and then with the right technology, and then get out of their way. Let yeah. them do the thing, you know? It's not like you have to micromanage them and to force them to be sitting at their desk from nine to five. Yeah. And this is something that has to do, I think, also with um, the way we as humans live and work. It's, it's not like our brains will necessarily think business from nine to five and afterwards you'll switch your brain and you'll start thinking about hobbies and families and anything else. It's really yeah. you know, a natural ongoing flow of different ideas. And so trust is, yeah. a, is a very new value in the working surrounding, would you say that? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. fundamental. Yeah. 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 And would you, how, how is it then at Dog Horse? Thank God it's Monday. <laughs> yeah, well, it's trust is one of our fundamental um, working principles, but we also really quickly figured out that it's not a given. Um, we had uh, we were really lucky to start out as, out as a group of friends, so we already had an established trust level, but it, it's hard work to keep that trust level. So it's not that once you have the trust, then, oh yeah, well, check that off and now let's work. Uh, we actually put a lot of work and effort in maintaining um, the trust to each other. And of course, with 30 people um, and no, like Boris already said, no hierarchy, no boss, no one who's making the decisions. Of course, we, we fight, um, but at the end of the day, we all know that we fight for a, a good reason and that we don't fight each other, but mm. um, that we can still keep the trust in each other as a, a person and as a, like you said, knowledge worker. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do you manage, let's say, the balance between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So obviously everybody likes to be paid, everybody likes to be valued, um, and um, these are things that you experience in your own structure, but also as you're working with big corporations and helping them to innovate. Uh, what is the difference between the dynamics uh, in Dark Horse and the dynamics that you see in corporations that you work with? Um, it basically come do comes down to what you already said. Um, in a lot, for a lot of our clients, they still rely very much on the extrinsic motivation so um, all the classic like bonuses and um, hierarchy levels that you can achieve and then growing bonuses and so on and so forth um, and for us because we started out in, in in that startup way and that's probably the case for most people in startups at the beginning we had well no money at all um, but here are 30 young 
back then, very young people um, who really like to work together and do great work without really knowing what that would be. Um, so in the beginning, it was all intrinsic, but um, of course we also have to live and of course we also want to live a good life. So yes, um, we also need the money um, and through a lot of um, iterations and a lot of experiences and up and downs, um, I think we now found for, for now um, a way to for now balance the two. But that's actually one of our struggles and it's not set in stone and this is how we do it, um, but we keep um, working on that. So how do we compensate um, for time and how do we compensate for um, tasks that nobody really likes? Things like that. That's, that's what we really have to work on and keep working on. And how does that al goes along with with values like uh, like flexibility and meaning? You also mentioned meaning is a is a, is a definitely a growing uh, value in a new working surrounding. So how does that goes along? Maybe to you, Christina. Yeah. So <coughs> at Evernote, um, in my team, so we are based in Zurich. We are running uh, the EMEA operations out of Zurich. We are twenty people, and you can clearly see that. You know, the, the turnover is very low. Mm -hmm. There are people who have been almost from the very beginning there. And they are still there because they found meaning in what they are doing. Mm -hmm. And because they are actually every day having a huge impact on millions of people's lives out there. So this is a, a very strong motivator yeah. in our case. Uh, on knowledge workers, and because um, when I did the research, I uh, it, it's it's actually not uh, um, it was foreseen that knowledge worker or that they're becoming mo uh, or that knowledge worker become more and more in our working society. And um, Peter Drucker already said decades ago the most valuable asset of 21st century institution, whether business or non-business, will be its knowledge workers and the productivity. So um, my question is, how can uh, companies unleash this individual potential of, uh, of that knowledge or also this in innovative potential? I mean, you at Dark Horse, you work with companies and consult them in this topic. Uh, how are they going to deal with that or do they deal with that? Well, do they deal with that? First qu or second question first. Um, yes, they increasingly do um, because, um, of course, they all read their druckers and whatnot, management literature. Um, but for now, it's all very much um, theory. But we see that a lot of big corporations right now try to actually um, walk the talk. Um, but, of course, it's very hard to break up 40 years or even more of um, structures and, and the way they work. And to us, it, it comes down to more principles instead of fixed rules. Um, and the principles are mainly um, collaboration and iteration. So really experiment, don't have a set strategy or rule and then go for it no matter if the circumstances change and um, what we call user-centeredness. And in a uh, company, the users or one of the set of users are the employees. So really try to see what works um, for your employees at any given moment. But that's something that's very far from a corporate reality so far. <laughs> a couple of years ago, <coughs> we have launched Evernote Business. Okay. And one of the ideas behind business was basically to surface all this hidden information inside organizations. Because even if you're a very small team, it is not humanly possible for you to know what your colleagues know. Mm -hmm. And you're spending some time, you know, a lot of time just uh, starting a project, doing some research, only to find out that somebody sitting like two desks away has been already working on that. And we thought this shouldn't be the case. You know, in order for you to be productive and to be smart and to make the good decisions, you should have great tools mm -hmm. that allow you to have easy access to whatever information is floating around in your company and can be valuable for your goals. Yeah. And then um, another idea behind business was also that we were ourselves frustrated with business software in general, and we were thinking, you know, why should you be punished when you're at work? Because <laughs> you spend most of your life working, yeah. you know, just using some lousy technology. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you're going back home and you just work on your beautiful whatever retina display device. Why? It shouldn't be like this. Actually, you should have a great time 
when you work and you should have the same user experience and you should feel like not you know technology is okay. controlling you or you're forced to use it but it's doing actually a service mm -hmm. Let's talk about this. Well, I think what, what you're mentioning, is, and I heard before the term AI interpreted in a new way as augmented intelligence, and uh, that which gives the user superpowers. You don't say it's a tool, but it's something that works in the background. And I guess this is what you were tr starting to explain. And there's the beauty of it, and I'd love to hear more about how we can use it in a positive way. But at the same time, in Germany, we, we talk a lot about data protection and... Uh, surveillance and also I know y you were born in Romania I was born in Soviet Union to repressive states uh, b being watched and having all the data accessible for everybody at all times has its ups and has its downs uh, how do you react to that sure so <coughs> let's start with um, artificial intelligence versus augmented intelligence so when we started uh, building Evernote it was clear for us that the way we perceive technology is uh, again, like giving you superpowers. So technology is not there to take over you or to think for you. It is there to be a natural extension of your needs and technology should be there to anticipate what you need in whatever context you're in. So Evernote was thought, you know, and you'll, you'll see augmented intelligence at work whenever you're using Evernote. But basically you're stepping into a meeting and if Evernote is connected to your calendar, it will suggest a, t a name for the meeting and it will add whatever relevant information without you having to actually, you know, kind of start searching and freaking out where is that article I've clipped and where yeah. is your business card and so on. So it was all about automating this kind of um, things that you would need in order for you to focus on what is really important, which is creative thinking, decision making, mm. coming up with new ideas, right? And there was a lot of discussion around you know, artificial intelligence for a long time now. And, and uh, you probably remember also when um, IBM's uh, Deep Blue, um, remember um, the episode with Gary Kasparov, the chess master. Um, and Gary Kasparov, he had an epiphany and he realized that actually the future of humanity is not necessarily man versus machine. This is not the right question to ask. Is it man versus machine? It's not. It's actually men and machine working together to make men smarter. Mm -hmm. And for us, this is really the future. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the other topic of data security and protection. <clears throat> Again, from the very beginning at Evernote, we made a very clear strategic decision when um, looking at how we want to build our business and how we want to make money. And for us, it was a long-term vision to give everybody a second brain to make the world smarter. And we knew that we couldn't achieve this if we start selling people's data. So from the very beginning, it was very clear for us that we will never monetize on people's data. Mm -hmm. Although you must say it's very appealing because you know, short term you can make a lot of money. You know, like if I, I look at what you're saving into Evernote, then I can sell you this product and you know, yeah. I can, it's, it's really interesting only from a marketing perspective for us for Evernote, it would be quite appealing. But we decided not to do so. Mm -hmm. Because again, we are here and this is why we say we are the 100 year startup because we believe that we can make a difference on the long term and if we want to gain people's trust, you cannot play tricks and you cannot yeah, do, absolutely. you know, whatever with, with their data. Yeah. So we, we take this very seriously and it's one of our top priorities, as you can imagine. So in terms of technical security and everything that has to do with it, it is really um, one of the focus at Evernote constantly. Mm -hmm. right. And another thing that we were discussing this afternoon was like when you put information into this, um, you on one hand have the opportunity to work in virtual teams, but you also have, if somebody leaves the team, the knowledge stays with the company. Um, again, there is an up and a down, which is great for the company. Um, knowledge is there, but how do you create, and this goes also to, to both of you, how do you create loyalty and commitment within this atmosphere of you're n we already have your knowledge and uh, we can build on it anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe going back to when we've launched Evernote Business, there was a third important idea behind it, which was, again, in terms of the user experience. Um, why should you go out of an application to access your personal notes when you can have everything, you know, personal business notes mm -hmm. in one place? So we wanted to have this one interface and you would have your business notes that you're sharing with your colleagues and your company and your private notes, but easily accessible on the same interface. So you 
wouldn't have to change anything. And then the moment you would leave um, a company, then all your business notes would stay with that company. Now, this is not done in a sense of controlling you because you can easily copy paste everything into your personal account if you want to, you know, yeah. so it was not done of that. But it was because, uh, again, as a company, especially with uh, people coming and going more and more, you want to make sure that the knowledge is preserved and whoever is joining the company has easy access to whatever projects have been done before. So this is actually helping a lot companies create this new modern workspace. And loyalty has to do, I think, um, again, with um, believing in, in a mission, you know, in our case, at least. It has to do, you can be loyal to a company because you truly believe that you can make a difference and you embrace the vision mm -hmm. and, and the goals. But, um, as you say, so if, uh, if we define a company as the sum of committed workers and uh, um, uh, s the sum of the information uh, a company creates and in a, in a sharing society where knowledge and uh, global sources uh, or where, where talents are sourced globally, what is the definition of a company then? How is business going to change or the yeah, corporates going to change? Maybe also, I'm, I'm wondering what Monica is thinking sure. about that. Um, well, for us, we decided early on that loyalty isn't something that you can enforce. Um, but we created an, an open system, um, and since we didn't find any um, system in, in the um, corporate world, we used an analogy, um, an another analogy, um, the analogy of monarchies. Mm -hmm. um, and at Dark Horse, you can choose now once a year at our so-called commitment day whether you want to be a monk or a nun for the upcoming year or uh, go on a pilgrimage. Um, so it might sound very um, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> very so. Have you been on a pilgrimage a so far? Pardon? Have you been on a pilgrimage? So I far? am actually right now. Um, okay. Yes, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, and you're and here. <laughs> yes, um, and that's sort of the the central um, premise of it. Um, so as a monk, um, you commit most of your time or some of your time um, to working at Dark Horse. Um, and you get sort of um, certain compensation for that, of course. Um, but you can also say, no, in the coming year, I want to um, do, I want to build a house, I want to raise a family or start a family, um, I want to work in another job, and then you are on what we call a pilgrimage, but you're not um, thrown out of the um, monarchy or out of the company. Um, but in the next year, you can decide whether you want to come back and work as a monk or a nun again or start or um, continue your pilgrimage. But you're always still part um, of the of Dark Horse. Um, you can work in a different job, but you're not, uh, you didn't like quit, um, but you're welcome to take your bag of experiences that you um, had on the pilgrimage and come back. And that's the uh, um, another way of creating loyalty, not by enforcing it, but keeping the doors open and inviting um, people to make different experiences. And actually for us, we discovered, or for us, that's really important for um, the way of working, because if we want to stay innovative, we cannot just close the doors and be with ourselves and not have different experiences. So it can be that you, or it might be then you then also end up being 30 years with our course, and changing companies around? Yeah, Might maybe. Be. We don't know yet, but yeah. So I was wrong in the beginning. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of 13 months, maybe also 30 years with, with Dark Horse. Yeah, 30 years with Dark Horse and 30 different jobs. Like a maybe. hub. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Not too bad. Yeah. But what do you see when you work? Uh, as I said earlier, you work with big corporations, a project I know with Audi, where you are also trying to help them innovate, get the teams uh, out of their regular yeah. thinking patterns. Um, are they open to these kind of, uh, let's say, structures? Uh, what we see a lot is that the, the C level is very open to that um, and also on the team level, so where the actual work gets done. But then the middle management is very reluctant because they fear um, of losing ground. So it's actually hard to convince them. And what in our experience, what works best is um, to have the support from the top management and then just make small steps within the individual teams and show that it works and show that um, it, it's not just uh, new work. It's not just because people like it or it's fun, but it actually works. It actually fits the 21st century. And once um, people realize that, 
then um, usually it, it's it's easy to convince people who are reluctant before. Right, and and Christina, I know you're also a very international team, so you have virtual workers around the world, your designers, developers, um, in different places. Uh, how does that play out? Again, going back to what you were saying before, you don't, you should not assume that it will just happen. You know, like building this company culture and and keeping people together will not just be there. You have to take steps and you have to work really hard to make it happen. And it's all about team building, you know? So it's all about making sure that you're encouraging differences of opinion, first of all. And this is something that in Zurich we are doing a lot because we are a bunch of very different people, different nationalities, different backgrounds. And, you know, it's only by the nature of things that um, sometimes you'll have clashes and people will feel that, oh, you know, my idea is better and I want to push it through. And then you have to help them and coach them to take a step back and first of all realize that it's great to have differences of opinion because if you're um, falling into this group thing kind of environment where everybody loves each other and they agree with each other not much will come out of it long term at least but then find a way to express those and, and to focus your energy into finding solutions to challenges because we have many challenges so don't direct that against each other but use that energy to find new creative ways to solve problems. And it's, a, it's an intensive process. And I think this is the new kind of leadership needed, especially for the mid-level, mm -hmm. as you were saying. So we, in our experience, true empowerment does not come from be making, um, being part of making decisions, but also deciding on how to make decisions. So um, deciding on the sort of governance that a team or a company has. And that's, of course, the, the highest level but once teams are enabled to decide upon their own governance then you have true empowerment and people are really passionate uh, about their work and really involved and you see that in the results uh, of those teams I was wondering how do what do you think about um, the uh, collaboration versus um, competition and um, so in your working routine as well as uh, in maybe also translating to features, I don't know. Everyone is of course supporting or it's more, more charming to say collaboration is better, but uh, also competition has also its uh, potential to innovate, of course. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, at Evernote, our philosophy of life is around collaboration and we do not actually believe in competition and this is not in an arrogant way. But we believe that, you know, life is not a sportive game where in order for us to win, somebody else has to lose. It's more like, you know, playing an orchestra where you have different people playing mm -hmm. the same instruments, but together you're doing something amazing. Mm -hmm. And this has played well for us when you look at all our partners, because, you know, people ask about our competitors and then we say, but look at our partners. They are Apple and Google and Microsoft yeah. and Moleskine and others. And this was only possible because we had this approach and we thought that, why should we even waste time, you know, looking at the competition or mm -hmm. trying to figure out how can we come up with something that will turn whatever into something else? Um, why not focus our energy to talk to those companies and together try to come up with something truly great? Mm -hmm. So as a team, we are also having this approach. And we believe that, again, collaboration can can be super super beneficial competition is is a bit tricky because you end up especially as an organization uh you know uh, politics uh, a lot yeah. of complications around it and and then it's not a healthy environment okay i think having this kind of flat structure empowering people and really fine-tuning every day seeing how can we do better and how can we make sure that people really feel empowered and responsible yeah. for what they are doing um, is really key for us at least yeah. this is our experience you see this one um, yeah I, I can second that we um, it's hard for us to compete against each other within our work because we are from so many different disciplines so um, my background is in writing so I cannot compete with my colleague who is an engineer it just doesn't make sense but mm -hmm. we also realized um, that we sometimes lack that element um, and so we introduce it in lots of playful elements. And that also comes back to establishing the culture of trust. Um, so we have sort of like an internal games league. And of course, we have the foosball and, and that sort of stuff. And we do 
spend time on that and mindful time on that to uh, um, have that sort of playful competition because for us it, it didn't work out without that element at all that we try to or we, we don't have it in our work in our teams it's just not there it wouldn't make sense so mm. we try to have it in another element well at the same time th the more freedom you give people obviously the more you need also to check if they're uh, reaching their goals I mean you have project deadlines you have scope you have budget um, you have deliveries, uh, MVPs, um, so you need to track what people are doing. And um, the more freedom you give them, do you feel you also have to find ways to track what they're doing and do compare what they're doing? So it may be not competition, but um, a friend of mine once said here, used the term co-opetition, so it's somewhere between uh, collaboration and competition, but still we need to see n numbers, we need to see milestones. Um, how do you manage that? <laughs> Well, we don't. Um, we actually we don't manage that. So um, as you said before, we really don't have a boss. There's no management level, nobody who controls what everybody else does. But we do it ourselves. So when we start out a project, the project team is responsible for everything, for budget, for planning, for just everything. And if you're not in time, if you're not in budget, it comes back to you as a team. Um, but of course, also, it comes back to the whole company. Um, and yes, mistakes have been making many of them. Um, and we realized, coming back to uh, sharing knowledge, um, if we don't share what doesn't work, um, then we can talk as much as we want about trust, um, then it, it doesn't work. So uh, we actually put, um, we actually emphasis that and we have an um, internal fail award that we give out regularly. Um, and you, it can get the fail award. Uh, you can only nominate yourself, um, so it's not a blame game, but you have to step up and say, okay, um, guys, friends, listen, I did this and that, and I won't share um, those fails here because it's, it's also just closed. It's a secret or a closed environment, um, but by sharing also what didn't work, um, we can learn from each other and hopefully not make the same mistake again. And those afternoons or those days are, are a lot of fun as well so it helps to um, share what didn't work but it's it's also it's hard so it ha you have to have the culture of trust so it's, it's, so it's sort of a circle um, you have to share your failures to get the culture but you need the culture to be able to share the failures and with Evernote I mean ha you have probably also very decentralized structure having the developers on another place than the marketing guys. Do you track that in any kind? The so results? Yeah, of course. No, we do. And what happens is that basically it starts with how and who you're hiring. Yeah. You know, so hiring the right people, people who are self starters. And from the very beginning, you know that you own your topic. Like mm. you're there because you're great at what you're doing and you are supposed to figure out whatever there is uh, in order to contribute to to us all yeah. reaching our goals. I think it's super important and critical to first of all define goals as a company and sometimes you, you see a lot of uh, companies and, and, and because it's tough, it's not easy, right? Define realistic aspirational also goals and <coughs> the way to track it afterwards is in our case, depending on the, on the department, I can give the example of my team in Zurich is um, we have team meetings and we come together, it's really like stand-up meetings, we see where we are, we check you know, where we are, what's needed, what can we do better, and then everybody's doing their thing, we come together in another week, and we kind of see again where we are, and we fine tune from one week to the other, but again, it's not like, because I'm the general manager, I'm sitting there, yeah. and you know, everybody has to report to me what they have been doing, and how it's going, because it's not working like this, again, it's a team coming together, everybody owning their topic, yeah us all interacting in a way as to figure out independently of you're working in sales or marketing, it doesn't matter. If it comes to whatever question related to user experience, we want everybody's opinion. And of yeah. course, you'll have one person or a team executing on that. But it's kind of involving the team um, and, and everybody knows that it's our goals. It's not the sales or the developers or the marketing team yeah. goals or really being part of the same boat and then I think um, in our case we we've done a lot of um, we've taken a lot of steps into making sure that we ban just bureaucracy <laughs> in general and we have these very explicit rules against 
you know, for example, stupid meetings. Now, a stupid meeting, what is a stupid meeting? A stupid meeting is the one where you come in, you don't know what's happening, you stay there, you write three emails, you send a message on WhatsApp, and then you leave the meeting and you have no idea what's gonna happen afterwards, you know? Yeah. So the, the way we look at it is, we say whenever you're putting or you're kind of booking time on somebody's calendar, keep in mind that you're taking one hour away of that person's life. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge responsibility and don't mess with it. Like think very well, is that meeting really needed? Can you solve it otherwise? And when you do call for a meeting, prepare, like, you know, send an agenda, say clearly what is expected, like what do we want to reach and then work it through. And yeah. I think this is really what, it's not easy again because just scheduling a meeting quickly it's it's uh, you know yeah it's because very you can appealing. really you get you can really get easily uh, drawn away from yeah. all their tools i mean me personally i i use trello slack yeah, yeah. google drive <laughs> skype evernote uh sometimes i really get crazy yeah and uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's not that easy to really dive through all this, this tool. What mm. would you recommend to a knowledge maker than me? How can you make my life easier? <laughs> it's a personal choice. I think, you know, it's, it's a curse and a blessing at the same yeah. time because you can look at all this uh, variety of tools as a blessing because you can actually select and customize, you know, so you can you can create your own Swiss knife kind of solution and you have in the, you know depending on what you want to work on you'll have different tools so um i know that it's also a curse because again you're getting lost with so many tools appearing every day and we at evernote we also use a lot of these tools because evernote doesn't solve it all mm. but it comes down to making sure that you keep up i think it's important to keep up with the technological um development but really being very mindful about technology not taking over you. Yeah. Because today, um, you don't know is that if you're looking for a message, was it on Slack? Was it on uh, Gmail? Uh, was it on Facebook? Like, where did I put it? <laughs> yeah, so you can, yeah, yeah you, but it's up to you at the end of the day to say, and to be really disciplined and to say, even if you're changing tools, like say, okay, now I'm switching to Slack. so. Whoever wants to follow me or wants to reach me, best way to reach me is on Slack. Well, no emails anymore. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes the best tool is to just grab the phone and call somebody or just meet in person. Um, at a, with a lot of our clients, they are on the same floor, but they always send emails to each other. And it goes back and forth for days and days. And you could just get up from your desk, walk to your colleague, and just get it all sorted out in maybe five minutes. But it's the sort of culture um, that you have around communication that mm -hmm. defines how you use the tool and not let the tools use you. Right, at the same time, organizing all these tools um, costs time, as you said, yeah. and then the question is if we're moving from exploitation to self-exploitation, meaning we do end up working more because we do have the goals and we're all of these f freelancers, knowledge workers, and we sit at home, we sit in the park, but at the end what we do is we still use the laptop, the, uh, the tablet or a smartphone to continuously communicate. So in Germany, um, work-life balance is an issue. P people do talk about, oh, what do I do in my free time? And there's a differentiation. And um, I know in the United States, I like to um, have not such a distinct um, difference, but how do you deal with that and um, how do you enable people to actually do have a better life uh, uh, work balance or is that something you aspire at all? We always speak about work-life integration versus work-life balance because why should there be this kind of, you know, contrast? Mm. At the end of the day, technology is empowering us today in ways unseen before and I think it's the very first time in history where we can get back our lives. But this comes with great responsibility. And this is where we need to, again, step back and find a new way to live and work by taking advantage of technology, not letting technology take and run over, you know, with our lives away. And it starts with simple things like deactivating push notifications. Like, why should you know whenever somebody is sending something, you know? Mm -hmm. It starts with simple things like, thinking about what you want to achieve and what is the best way to do it and allowing technology to be that enabler for you to automate, you know, like you can have whatever emails automatically saved somewhere or I don't know, there are millions of ways in which you can 
you can use technology to work for you, to have it as your private assistant. But this means a new way of looking at life. And I think we need, we need really uh, role models. We need people yeah. like, like you here, you know, to actually be more vocal about what is the best way to, to work and how can we actually use technology to our advantage. Because just to give an example, uh, when I started working as a PR assistant uh, in Bern in Switzerland, uh, that was some years ago, <laughs> Uh, what would happen, uh, and I had a, a very small kid back then, so um, now she's, she's almost uh, 15, so it's, uh, it's much different. But back then it was really, I was working in this agency, I had to be in the office at 9, and my boss would be not accepting any 5 minutes delay, like you had to be showing up at 9, if not you would be probably fired or something. So rushing through the traffic with the kid because, you know, I had to go to the kindergarten, sometimes it would be just almost impossible, stressed out completely <laughs> when I, I would arrive at work because of all, you know, trying to figure out how to get at work on time and so on. At work, um, back then as a PR assistant, first thing you would do, you would take literally a pair of scissors and you would start cutting out articles from newspapers, depending on the client you would have, and then you will clip them into this huge uh, folder. Yeah. And then your boss would ask, okay, could you please find me that article with a CEO from three years ago? And you will literally go and flip through <laughs> all the, the stuff. Thank God. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you realize, you know, like for what? Because today, if I would be um, a PR assistant, my life would be much easier and I could actually focus on more meaningful things. And I think this is where technology is helping us really, really in a good way because you can, you can spend more time focusing on improving your skills, learning and doing something that has to do with creative thinking rather than just repetitive tasks. I think a lot of it comes back to user-centeredness or uh, again, um, because uh, often the corporations take the one for all approach and then the emailing is switched off at, I don't know, 5 p.m. Um, but for me, for example, I have a baby at home as well and I send emails out to my colleagues and also to clients at 11 p.m. Um, but they all know um, that they don't have to reply at 11.05 p.m. Um, they know that I do it because at night um, I, I can sit at my desk and actually get the work done um, and that I won't reply at 9 a.m. Uh, because that's when I'm busy. Uh, so they know that yes, I do reply, but they have to wait for it. And if the emailing would be switched off at 5 p.m., it would be a disaster. I couldn't work anymore. Um, so the solutions um, that are taken care of by some um, well-meaning corporation for all their employees, sometimes uh, they are not so great for all of their employees. And that's, I think, a mistake that gets um, made, especially in Germany, um, very often. I was just thinking if there, if there is the risk of a digital divine between workers. So because one, uh, the one person knows how to use the tools uh, or knows how to, to deal with uh, um, yeah, communication technology, the others don't. So how we are going to overcome this gap? Can we? There's certainly this issue, but I think depending on, on the industry you're in and if you're looking at uh, adoption of technology, it's kind of, you know, happening organically after some time if a tool is becoming popular more and more people will pay attention and you have the power of the crowd again you have whenever something is becoming popular a lot of forums and discussions and people are being vocal about how that specific tool is helping their lives yeah. um, sometimes tool just like with slack in our case you know everybody suddenly from one day to the other everybody was using slack so you know it was like okay we have to give it a try and see what's uh, what's it all about and Sometimes it's easy because it's really, like in the case of, uh, I don't know, something like Facebook or others, uh, Instagram, it's very easy to get. Yeah. With tools like Evernote, it's a bit more tricky because it's rather complex and you would not get in five minutes what you can actually do with it. So it requires you taking time, reading some articles, getting maybe, you know, making your experience for a couple yeah. of times. So it is an investment. And there is a risk that actually you're missing out on tools just because it's not so easy to adopt them. And this is where I think we as companies and we as Evernote, we need to do a better job in making that user experience, especially at first launch, better. 
because we, we haven't been that great actually. But at the same time, the tools uh, won't solve it because we see that with a lot of clients as well that, oh, here's this new technology or this new tool, implement it and then check done. And that's like you said, that doesn't work. Uh, you actually have to enable people to use whatever new tool you create um, and also if yeah. you yeah and also if you just always implement whatever's newest on the market you'll always be behind because you need to have employees or um, students we talked yeah. about education before as well students who are prepared for what what will there be next and not what's there now um, and that's a, a big mistake I think that a lot of companies and that the education system as a whole currently is making I mean, b basically, when you hire now, you have to. It used to be you need to to be able to manage Office products. Um, so now you have okay, you have Microsoft products, 365, all in the cloud. Then you have Google Apps. Um, then you have Evernote. You have all these different tools. And I was talking today to an agency that is promoting Google Apps for corporations and say, in the end, they have it all installed, but only a few people actually know how to use it. It's like driving in a Ferrari in the first uh, gear. This is, um, you have everything available, you just don't know how to use it. So how do you deal with that when recruiting and people, as we said earlier, don't stay with companies that long. So you invest in these people, you teach them, and then you move on. And then you have the next generation that you need to cheat, teach. And as we said, a school system are also not preparing you for this. So. In our case, I guess we are lucky because we developed this tool that you know kind of retains knowledge. So independently of how people are coming and leaving, and we are seeing this as the new normal, you know, so it doesn't, it's not shocking if people would come and would stay for only a couple of months and then move on. But what we want to make sure is that, first of all, the time they spent with Evernote is um, a great experience for them and they are learning because if they are happy and they are learning, then, you know, in those uh, few months they are with the company, they would contribute significantly. So we try, first of all, to create this kind of infrastructure that allows for this very, you know, rapidly shifting workforce, which again, is not necessarily the case. So we have like in Zurich, for example, and, and also in other uh, cities around the world, people have been staying with Evernote for quite some time now. But sometimes we, we see um, people coming and going and we are prepared to deal with that and we see it as the new normal. So um, the goal is not necessarily loyalty at the end of the day but is how are you creating an environment where you can come up with amazing ideas and execute them mm. Mm. having different players and i think it has to do also with um, the future of, wor of work in general where it's no longer a question of companies as such you know it's more like structures of teams coming together and True. it's the new freelancing economy where i think it's more just like I think for you at um, Dark Horse, this is a great example. You have different people, different backgrounds coming together in a very, you know, unorganized way. And it's, it's working, you know. Mm. This is the perfect example that it's actually working. I think what's also interesting at Dark Horse, you are, you are uh, looking especially at the Generation Y. And they are the ones who are defining the working surrounding of today or the next tomorrow. And um, I was wondering, because they also get described as the Peter Pan uh, generation, so they're jumping around the selfie generation and come and go. Um, how, how do they define the working surrounding and uh, what's, the dif what's the difference to the Generation X? Well, that's the, the Peter Pan definition. I think that's a definition by the, the baby boomers um, or yeah. they don't want to uh, grow up. Um, well, if growing up means to stay at one company for 30 years and um, looking forward to retirement and the weekend and not work, yes, we don't want to grow up. That's right. Um, and uh, Generation Y has been defined as, like you said, um, selfie generation and always looking um, for a new opportunity. Um, it's all about flexibility. Um, but we think that's not necessarily true if you create an environment um, where everybody can um, thrive and can actually live um, to that kind of um, selfiness potential. Um, we see a lot of uh, collaboration going on, ex more than there was before. Um, 
and I would say that's the main difference to the Generation X, which has been described um, as just me, 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 and money, money, money. Mm -hmm. um, that's something like you mentioned before, that's supposedly not so important um, to Generation Y anymore. I'm not so sure um, about that, um, because uh, we talked about the, the sharing economy um, as well before, yes, but somebody still needs to own all the stuff that gets to be shared. Um, so the digital, um, digital, digitalization enables us to live the lifestyle of the baby boomers and of Generation X without having to own all that. But the lifestyle is still um, pretty much um, attractive to a lot of us. And what we see uh, with our clients or what we actually um, know from five years of experience working in changing organizations is that Generation Y is actually um, not so it's very much of an artifact uh, because a lot people of all ages and of all backgrounds want to enjoy their work they just have been taught for 30 years that it's not possible that fun is on the weekend and fun is um, when you're retired but it's not a generational thing it's just that generation y uh is not like we don't take that anymore we don't uh, want to work in an environment that doesn't fit us that that doesn't fit our needs, that's not fun. So I think that's the difference, that we are in a position to actually ask for uh, what we want. But the need itself, that's not a generational thing. Right. I mean, that may have not changed. And you're also in a very privileged position where, let's say, you are um, in, in a group of people and you decided to create a brand together. When we talk about freelancers today and a lot of people who use Evernote and other collaborative tools, they have to build their own brands to survive in this economy because in a hire and fire or in a um, find a new project, it's over uh, uh, economy. I have to be strong and not only in my knowledge, but also in promoting that knowledge. So um, the me, me, me um, uh, generation it does have um, it, it's, let's say, um, merits in because you need to promote yourself. So how do you deal with all these self promoters? Because once you hire them, they're still in that same mo m mode. So you have c you have collaboration between a lot of people who constantly need to promote themselves as individuals and brands. Well, give them great work. Which they, yeah. <laughs> Pardon? And then they start to collaborate, you think? I think so, yes. And they will promote themselves via the great work that they do with your team or with your company mm -hmm. like you. Set. Absolutely. So give them great work and not only that, but allow them to do their side projects and salute that, you know, and encourage okay. them to do something else. You know, like if they want to, why not? If they want to write an article on Medium and do something else at the same time, that's great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just curious because let's say in the when YouTube started, we saw a lot of people having a lot of opinions, and, and these videos did have some, actually some some strength and some curiosity. And um, it, when you look at you now today, which is a new channel live streaming, and you hear all these voices, uh, you realize it's all about self promotion and with a lack of content. So we're looking at the next generation of only promoting, where there's not even. The, the expertise that they're promoting, but just themselves as whatever. A brand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, somebody must be interested in watching all those self-promoters, so there must be some sort of um, value in mm. that self-promotion, giving some sort of meaningful whatever to to all those people who watch those self-promoters. So, for example, all the um, I know all those um, videos that teach you, I don't know, how to do your makeup or how to sew your own clothes. So that's obviously of some sort of um, value. It, it, it seems uh, very self-promoting to just put on your makeup in front of the camera all the time. Yes. But let's switch to digital literacy then. It means very early on we all need to learn how to deal with these tools. And have you both in, in some ways collaborated with uh, schools, institu institutions, younger generation and have any experience in how they're perceiving all these tools as a threat or as an opportunity? Evernote is very much used by students and different schools, universities around the world and what is really great, I wish I had Evernote when I was in school, because what it does, it allows you to take the knowledge with you as you grow. Uh, when I was at the university, we, we still you know, were writing everything on paper. <laughs> and when I moved out, my parents decided that what's that bunch of crap, you know, like let's throw it out. <laughs> 
and then everything was gone from one day to the other nothing so even if i would like to go back and i don't know you know i had old english for god's sake uh, as a topic at university i don't remember anything like literally nothing it's completely tabula rasa so <laughs> there is no way i can go back to that whereas today with tools like evernote and others you can grow and you can take the knowledge with you and and this is extremely powerful um, it's also very powerful in terms of teachers interacting with you on uh, on a more customized level and also with the parents because it happens that there's a, a lot to improve on the just school parents communication side as well so um, this from what we are seeing it's not all schools around the world but more and more schools are working uh, are working with with technology and um, they are even allowing kids to take their own devices and and you know access whatever when they are studying a specific topic just go to specific resources I think what is really important is to teach um, kids and also um, adults not to use a specific technology but to live in the technical or digital um, society and to understand um, what digitalization does with the way that we collaborate and um, the way that we work and the way that we learn but that's something different than um, having a tool and understand how to use it it means understanding why that tool exists and how people use it and um, being able to maybe create the next tool um, and yes uh, you need some sort of technology for that and yes in German school um, technology doesn't from what I know in most schools technology doesn't very much exist at all um, and yes that's probably good if that changes but you also need to teach kids um, of how to uh, how to be creative and how to be curious and um, how to um, actually discover things that they're really interested in and maybe create the next I don't know Google or Evernote mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great point because when you look at education, there's so much that needs to be done because we are we are basically, you know, preparing kids for a future that will not really be there. You know, we are we are teaching them based on an old model and it's not up to to speed to what is happening today. So we should go back and encourage creativity. I think creativity and everything that has to do with artistic performance and and everything that has been seen as not worthy of you know school in yeah. general design thinking design thinking For should example. be i think design thinking should be now part of really uh, primary school if possible you know mm -hmm. <laughs> on a normal um, on a very very um you know kind of basic level because if you think about technology and humans in the future what is the biggest differentiator right it's really creative thinking. This is what technology is not necessarily able to do for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not able to come up with creative solutions. Um, it will not be able to have the dexterity human has. You, you cannot have a robot walk through a room and bring you a glass of wine without um, tripping or something. So um, this is what makes us really special and powerful. And again, we are, unfortunately still victims of this legacy of the post-industrial era where mm -hmm. education had to prepare this workforce for you know coming under one roof and and being controlled and giving the output needed but this is no longer the case and i think again we should stop killing creativity in schools because this is still happening and this is really very sad so it's not so much a question of technology and empowering kids with technology it's more a question of rethinking education and school and teaching kids that you know it's no longer a question of just going to the right school and then you'll get a job and then you'll be happily employed until yeah. you're going and, and retire Retiring. because this is no longer the case and what what is making the, the difference today is the, the variety of skills of things you learn things you've experienced and also coming together and having the possibility to to have an opinion and to yeah. express it and to interact with others in a smart way. Just looking at the at the time. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll open it up to, to the, the audience the and in, in one second and I have uh, maybe one one more question because what, what you're saying is and, and maybe that's to you just because not everybody is familiar with with design thinking, and uh, when y when you say uh, it should be um, taught in a primary primary school. Um, 
I think Picasso said once, everyone is born an artist. Um, so is design thinking uh, reawakening this uh, inner child? Um, it can be. Design thinking is a way um, of working together and creating um, products and services that um, really help people or that are really desired by people. Um, and if it's done or if it's understood in the right way, it can open up uh, people's potential. Um, but what we see very often is that it's just another set of tool, um, just um, a new method and try it out once and oh, it doesn't really work. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, so the way we understand it is um, actually as a, a culture and as a set of values um, and uh, that incorporates the designed mindset um, and uses that f to uh, work on projects. And yet then it can actually work. Cool, thank you. So any questions from uh, the audience? Um, anybody would like to know more? Um, do we have a microphone actually? I have one. <laughs> um, please stand up and speak loud or come here and we'll give you a mic. Uh, I have one question to Monica and one question to Christina. Uh, Monica, I would be curious um, how do you actually organize the internal body of knowledge at Evernote? And most importantly, how do you make tested knowledge explicit and shared between your weapons? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we were lucky enough to develop the tool ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's, uh, but sometimes it's, it's true that, you know, it's, it's complex because just when, think about tags, just to give an example, if everybody starts coming up with tags, then you end up having trillions of tags floating around and you, you cannot find anything. So it needs some, some discipline. So sharing knowledge um, has to do again with finding some structure, first of all, agreeing upfront on how do we want to structure our notebooks as Evernote, you know, because everybody has a tendency to just create notes and notebooks and add everything everywhere. But um, as a company, if you really want to be efficient, you have to have a structure. And you have to spend a lot of time from the very beginning agreeing and making sure everybody really is on the same page when it comes to how do we, for example, use tags, how do we want to create notebooks and who has access to what. And the guiding uh, principle is for us, less is more. Like don't create uh, one million uh, notes and notebooks just make it really very easy and simple to, to get and to understand. Does it answer your question? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, I was sure that you use your own tool, but what was, what was happening in the rules uh, before, uh, let's say, the next to the individual note taking, is there also a group process? We really, um, uh, share all, all of your practical knowledge, because you mentioned if, if workers leave, you have everything documented, you can share it uh, immediately? Yeah. So the way it works is in the business so-called library, you would have these different notebooks and they are uh, having one owner, the administrator of the business library. Independently of whoever is joining or leaving, those notebooks will stay the same. You know, So everything that one person is saving into that note will stay there independently of that person coming or going. And if you come up with the right structure from the very beginning and you say, you know, you have like an HR notebook where everything related to HR issues stays in there, then you have something related to international marketing and you know that everything related to international marketing will be found there. It doesn't really matter who's coming on or who's contributing because you'll know that this is the place where you'll find everything that is really important to that topic. And we have also for, um, for bigger companies already in our case is quite useful. It's the expert um, kind of showing up whenever you're looking for a topic. Evernote will indicate who is that person inside the company who really knows everything about that topic. And that helps because you know if you don't really find what you need, then you can actually, you know who to contact and you know exactly uh, who, who may be helping you then. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, to Monica, one short question. And you have an amazing culture with a flat, uh, a flat organization with all hierarchies. Um, how do you actually solve the decision dilemma? Uh -huh. I mean, mm -hmm. who, who decides, the individual or the group? Yeah, I was waiting for that question. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, so um, in projects, it's always uh, the project team who decides in whatever way they see fit. Um, but for strategic decisions that are important for the whole company, um, it's actually all of us who decide. But it's not um, it's not a top down decision making system, and it's also not a democracy. But it's um, sociocracy or holacracy um, is a newer term that maybe some of you might be familiar. Um, and the difference is that not the number of opinion counts, um, but the strength of opinions. Um, so the way that it really works is that we sit together um, and somebody brings up um, a certain decision. So um, that's the first difference maybe, that you just don't start off with a random topic, um, but you always have um, a decision as um, the, the basis basically. Um, and then there's a this gets very technical, so there's the first round of information, um, does everybody know everything to really take the decision? Um, then everybody's heard, um, and then we actually take the decision, and the decision is taken if nobody is against it. So um, in essence, everybody, every one of us has a, a veto right, um, but you have to think about it um, as an emergency break. Uh, so you only use it when you think, we as a company, we can't really, we can't do that. Um, I have to get off the train if we, if we take that decision. Um, and that's, of course, something that you have to train a little bit. Is it really, really that important for me personally, or is it just something that I think like, ah, oh, I don't really like it, but let's just go for it. Um, and over time, you develop sort of a, a feeling for your personal limits. But if somebody draws that veto card, uh, we just don't take the decision. But just with the emergency break, you get punished for that. You have to sit down with the person or the persons who um, had the who initially um, brought in the decision and figure out a new solution and come back to the meeting next week or next day. Um, yeah, so you talked about flexibility. And when you have flexibility, it brings a choice. And choice means freedom. But it's usually, what I feel is that the more choice you have, the more it paralyzes you. And at some point, especially technology, you have so much to choose as you go back to pen and paper because it, it kind of gives you back to basic and gives you some sort of like feeling for what you uh, you do. And I'm generation Y and I kind of feel that you talk about education as well, that you can do whatever you want, you invest inside the project, there's no like destined path for it and it's the same problem that you are flooded with information and you can't decide. So how do you feel that's going to change in the future and how can you, I don't know, make decisions in a world where you're just overwhelmed with the amount of choice you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Now back to pen and paper, this is really funny because, you know, a couple of years ago, many people were saying, you know, Evernote biggest competitor is Post-it because, you know, people take notes on Post-its and uh, Moleskins and such. And for us it was, why? <laughs> no, <laughs> this is not really the case because we are very humble about, we, we look at our users and we don't want to kill paper in any way. You know, on the contrary, it's like if you're using pen and paper, we want to figure out a way to support that. Mm -hmm. And we've had these partnerships we've launched with Post-it and with Moleskine that help you if you want to give a digital life to, to your physical iconic objects, then you have the possibility to do so. And it goes back to this need of us finding the new way of living and working. You know, So it's not easy. Who said it's going to be easy? But um, this is the beauty of the situation we have right now. We have so many possibilities. It, it's a luxury situation at the end of the day because you know it's a good problem to have just to be able to choose. But it goes back to spending time with yourself, which is not easy, and really looking at what are you trying to do with your life. Like, what are you trying to do here? What is your goal? And how can you use whatever resources you see around you? And it can be technology, but it can be people, you know, networks, people who can support you grow, things that you can learn that can be in various shapes and forms. But it has to do with us learning to be more mindful and more honest with ourselves and not just take life for granted and saying, oh, you know, I'm going to just do my thing every day, get a job and try to be, you know, getting my salary and there are so many, hap uh, so many unhappy people doing this. And for the very first time, we have actually the possibility to change this. And you don't have to be unhappy for the rest of your life. But it is not easy. You have to be, first of all, learning to listen to yourself and to also realize that it's absolutely OK to change, to have different goals as you grow, 
to see life in different ways and try to adapt at each step you're taking, trying to look around you and see what can help me grow. Is it technology? Is it people? Is it learning something new? Is it trying something new? It is not the easiest path, but I think it's what brings, at the end of the day, the most meaning to, to our lives. Yes, the yep. pain of freedom. <laughs> it's always the pain of choice. Um, right now, um, this week I'm working, what time is it, um, but maybe five hours, I'm on uh, maternal leave right now, um, but before, it's actually for me hard to pin down, it depends, uh, weeks are very different, um, so some weeks, if I had to be honest, I would have to say 70 hours, and some weeks would be, and I'm not talking about vacation, some weeks would be 15 hours, so it really there's no weekly amount that's yeah there's no normal week for me i personally don't count and this is not to say that i work too much but it's because i i don't look at it anymore like working you know it's my life and i really really love what i'm doing i really love the job i'm in and uh, the time i spend with people and i try to make those decisions with my life that allow me again to find meaning and this means that sometimes you have to say no and learning to say no, again, is not easy. But um, at the end of the day, if you see life as a series of events that, again, help you reach, reach your goals, your personal goals, um, you'll have the possibility to find a better way of dealing with everything. And in my case, I think I'm fortunate enough to work for, for Evernote and they are totally okay with me deciding on where I wanna be, how, and you know, there, there are no restrictions in terms of how I should structure my day or where I should be. And I have, I have um, also two kids, so um, I think for, for the very first time, again, I found the kind of the magic recipe that allows me to really be part of something that is truly great, where I can clearly see I'm learning a lot, I am developing myself, I'm part of a great group of people, um, and being able also to be there for my kids when when it's needed and um you know finding the meaning to my life i really feel that um this is again has to do with those decisions you have to take on daily basis and also i think when you have kids you have to also realize that you cannot make everybody happy you know <laughs> so mm -hmm. at one point in time somebody will be unhappy your team or, or your kids because you'll say no on, on or yourself you know so you kind of have to live with that as well and and um, accept the fact that you're not perfect and this is not the idea. But um, what drives you, and in my case, it's all about learning and being with people and learning from, from people and having these interactions, um, continuously challenging in the sense of, um, you know, why shouldn't you start learning finance one day? Because mm. why shouldn't you, you know? Um, having the possibility to do so gives you a, a better, I think, a better meaning uh, in life in general. And for the very first time, I found time to to meditate and and to be more more mindful and and to exercise. And you know, this wouldn't have been possible like five years ago, because back then I was way too much under pressure, but pressure, especially not only by, by the company I was working for or myself, but it was just, you feel like, you know, there's this pressure, you have to reply to every email and you have to be very reactive and you have to make your, your way through and so on and so forth. And then um, suddenly you realize that, why? You, you shouldn't be as reactive. And this is where I think mindfulness and, and meditation, in my case, this completely changed my life because at the end of the day, that time you spend, and it can be 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day, to again take time for yourself and look inside and try to see and put things in perspective again and, and think about your life in general and where you want to be. Uh, this helps a lot in dealing with everything else. 
it's also um, for me it also sort of come back to uh, comes back to your question so what is work is it work if I read an um, an article at 9 p.m is it work if I discuss um, their project with my colleagues that I have nothing to do with um, that doesn't feel like work to me but um, it might be if my role is a, I don't know a social media manager that might actually be part of my work so um, we usually um, there's a tendency to define work as stuff that you don't like to do and I think that's really the most the, the worst definition that you can um, get of work and our aim is um, to not have work or not make work the worst part of your day or of your week and then it's like you said it's hard to say how much do you work if you actually really like what you do is that work then that was also big the topic of your book because uh, it's lying here yeah. no one shows it so this is the advertisement <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank god it's monday means you really like to go to work on mondays right that was it Yes, so we don't always like all the stuff um, that we do. Of course, we also have to do expenses and we also um, have to deal with a lot of, uh, I don't know, emails that we don't really like to deal with at that given moment. Um, but we realize that um, having fun all the time is not, um, that's not what it's all about. Um, it's not that you really are super happy and enjoy what you do 24-7, but it's uh, it's about the bigger, the purpose and the meaning. And um, yes, uh, Monday morning um, is not the worst time of the week. Um, there might be tasks that we don't enjoy, but work, uh, we, we like our work and we don't um, threat uh, Mondays. So that's sort of um, the aim that we have at Dark Horse. Great. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I think. Uh, I'm Noor from Bova, and I lead the People Partnership Team at SoundCloud. And I'm following all the developments at Zapos with uh, 100%. So I'm curious to hear from you working in that setup. Like, how scalable do you think it is? If you were giving that example of the decision making, at one point in growth, there will be some tension, right? That was your view. Uh, yeah, that's actually uh, one of the questions that are we are dealing at uh, with at Dark Horse right now. Um, and it is scalable, um, but in a different way. Um, so we, you have to think of individual sort of cells or individual teams um, who are just combined by a single mission or vision or um, just uh, a single brand, uh, but who are not uh, centralized. Um, so that's a different way mode um, of scaling. Um, if you bring 150 people in one room, that sort of decision making would tag on forever. But we realized that there are actually very, very few decisions that need to be everybody, not everybody needs to be involved in every decision, not everybody is interested in um, every decision. So the way of scaling is actually very often in our experience scaling it down. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, absolutely. I'm okay. curious to hear what your personal view is on the, on the switch that Zappos made, coming from a different model and moving to it. Like, how are you following that, assuming that you're following it? That is my first question. Can you say that again? Sorry. So Zappos? Oh, Zappos. Oh, yeah, the holacracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is yeah, yeah, your yeah. personal view on that? Because it's slightly different, right? They're coming from a different model. Yes. Um, I've been following just what we can get um, from the press, and I have to say that I'm a very s a, a little bit skeptical of the boss um, getting rid of himself or herself. Um, but what we see from the press, it seems to work. Um, so I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that. Sapos last year, I think, or yeah, I think last year, um, switched to holacracy, so to sort of a similar decision making process and a similar governance that. Um, or elements of that government that we have at Dark Horse. Um, and from what you gather at the press, it seems to work okay, but also because they um, ask everybody in advance um, if they want to be part of it. And I think 20% of the people chose to um, not be part of that. So they were let go or they chose to um, not be involved in that um, system because obviously um, you have to be willing to give up some sort of aspirations um, it's not possible anymore um, to next year next year be the boss of, of your team because that in that system doesn't exist and yes it's not for everybody um, so with that premise um, it seems to work well but from what I get um, from press coverage Kay. any other questions 
good. I I, th I think we'll, we'll we'll round up because what, from what we heard so far, it's it's in the end, it's not about the hours. It's about the quality of uh, what we do or don't call work, but about uh, and I think at the dark horse you say it's uh, the. Um, unbedingte uh, Lebenserfüllung, something like f fulfillment of life uh, with uh, without any limitations and it feels like your work has become your life same to you and I'm, I'm very impressed to uh, see how you uh, um, champion that and hopefully we'll, we'll see more of that I mean we started to discuss this because we feel the knowledge workers do need new ways to yeah. unite and uh, maybe one one last thought from the two of you how do you see can uh, knowledge workers in the future be more empowered and collaborate and uh, create a better future last question to you <laughs> deep yeah <laughs> very yeah, deep yeah, yeah, yeah. i know <laughs> Well, I think there's not one um, cookie cutter way of um, this is uh, how you have to do it or this is how it works um, or um, even less so this is how we did it at Dark Horse, please, here is your recipe, do it wherever you are. Um, I th it comes back to what you said, you really have to think about um, what you really want to do and yes, that's hard work and coming up um, with our solution for our needs um, was hard work and it still is. Um, and the, the basic principle is that um, adapt your work um, to your life and not your life to your work. So I think if you keep that at heart, um, that's your solution already. But it's hard work. It doesn't come easy. It's still work. <laughs> There's a lot of concern around technology. But shouldn't we be more concerned about actually society and what we are doing all together in order to not necessarily keep up with the technology, uh, technology development, but create a new model that allows us to work in a smarter way and to be happier and to have actually all together contribute to a distribution of happiness around the world and resources and so on. I think it is, especially now with the technology we have at hand, you know, social media and so on, more than ever possible to come together and also, you know, find a new way of policy making and so on that allows for social entrepreneurship and ideas that can help us find this new way of living. Because technology, it is not so much that it's gonna take uh, away jobs uh, or, or destroy our future. It is really within our own power to actually do something about it today and try to use whatever resources we have at hand to come up with something smarter that benefits us all. And if you ask, I think the majority of population of this earth would be in favor of coming up with, with systems and models of living and working where you wouldn't feel again unhappy and going uh, and having a lousy job for 40 years just because mm -hmm. you have to. Together with, uh, you know, like having this um, new smart leadership you can figure way. Um, you can figure out ways in which technology can create new jobs that can benefit us all. But mm -hmm. it requires a lot of effort, and it requires us coming together and discussing and figuring out. And it's not easy. The easiest part is just to outsource to technology and say, "Hey, let technology do everything," and we 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 just sit down <laughs> and uh, relax. You know. So I think it's really important that again. Also, events like this one, it's, it's really inspiring and I look forward to, to talking to you afterwards because it's important for us to voice concerns and it's equally important to also challenge what we have today and ask ourselves, can we do better? Mm -hmm. Can we live smarter? Mm -hmm. Because we do have the power to change things. Very good. Great. Thank you for the roundup. Thank, Thank you for you. the insights. And um, if you want to see any of this later or share it with your friends on ddaynetwork.com, uh, there will be the film and everything. Uh, you can leave comments. And uh, again, thank you so much for you Thank two you. joining us today. Thank you, everybody, Thank for, you for inviting yeah. us. Thank, Thank you. you.